In those mountains, he, Prometheus, in those mountains, he met others walking in the same direction. Backpacks, black plastic garbage bags, mm. food sacks, a girl with two hard-boiled eggs, the shells flaking off. Some wore t-shirts from the sports teams of the West. And one man still carried an orange life jacket. The hunted, wayward god stood beside a mother who held her infant before her. In the same way, he held the stalk that carried the embers he had stolen. He noted dry myrtle along the side of the road and saw a ground that seemed soft enough for them to sleep on. There would be at least this much tonight. Twigs for a fire, perhaps water for tea, some warmth in the morning. All right. So, what, what, uh, it's a beautiful poem. Thank you. A lot of uh, images yeah. um, from <laughs> Prometheus and from what, what uh, inspired it. Well, I, you know, it was, of course, those, those, those both inspiring and horrifying images of all of the migrants of the Eastern Mediterranean, from Syria especially, of course. But, you know, across the Middle East, people were moving and through Anatolia, through the mountains were of Were you there at the time? Not at the time, no. Mm -hmm. This is all, you know, by yeah. thinking yeah. about it. But then I also thought, this is the very sort of place or areas where the ancient gods walked. And right. so, oh, so yeah, I, yeah, yeah. So I thought, yeah. hmm, if you think about it for a minute, the ancient gods were really just personifications of a certain spirit. And the idea of bringing fire to people, that spirit of it seemed to me something worth bringing to the question of people on, you know, who, were, who were struggling to survive yeah. and walking through um, countries and places where they had nothing, yeah. you know, yeah. and no, so... I love the images. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, t tell us, uh, tell us a, little, a bit about your life. Um, How did you come to poetry? Um, yeah, first of all, it's a hard question, you know. Uh, uh, in life, I think that I came to poetry, I, I sort of fell in love with it, when I was a freshman in college, and that's a long time ago. <laughs> um, but I remember vividly, um, in the second semester of that year, I had a great teacher. His name was Rodney De La Santa. Um, actually, I wrote a po an elegy for him in yeah. his book. And I love that name, De La Santa, even then. Yeah. Yeah. And, but he was, a, he was a very committed teacher. And, and among other things, he, he, allowed, he taught Dante's Inferno to freshmen. And also, I studied and read very carefully Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I remember that the combination of Dante and Hopkins, both kinds of poetry, um, uh, captured my imagination. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. And so, you know, sooner or later, you start to write things on your own. Uh -huh. Saul Bellow uh, once said and wrote that a writer is a reader who's been moved to emulation. And I read that only many, many years after, but that is yeah. what happened to me. Uh -huh, uh -huh. You know? Yeah. Uh, and then... Um you you went into the military or what? Yeah, happened? this was in 1968. Yeah, and this was a, as anyone, you know, of my age, and certainly anyone who studied the time know how turbulent it was. And I was from a working class background, and I graduated from college. I, I don't know exactly why, but I tried to sort of in this area here. Yeah, I was in Providence. Yeah. I grew up yeah. in Providence. In Providence. Right. And um, and it was sort of like my my roots asserting themselves. I thought that. I should go to the war that was going on then to write about it. And it was a kind of callow, youthful judgment. You, you volunteered? Yeah, I enlisted. Uh, uh -huh. And I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I became an officer. Yeah. And two years later, I left as a conscientious objector. I was in Okinawa at the time. I had right. not gone to Vietnam. Um, and But I left um, in part um, because I, in those two years I grew up. And one of the ways in which I grew up is that... Um, I, I learned um, about the My Lai Massacre. Yeah. And uh, I was in Okinawa at the time, and yeah. I remember saying to myself when I saw the first reports of it, I had an instantaneous reaction that, A, this is not what I signed up for, 
and B, I'm not a Nazi, and that's how I put it to myself. Yeah. That I, I wasn't in the atrocity Amazing. business. Amazing. And that yeah. began about a six month process of reassessing everything. And, uh -huh. it, and about nine months or 12 months really later, I left. Uh, I was the first Marine officer to be honorably discharged as a conscientious subject. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. And um, uh, I signed up when I was 18 as a conscientious subject. Did you? Yeah. yeah. And, and eventually they, they allowed it to, to me. But it's a very hard road to, yeah. to, uh, to get to it. I, I often yeah. say that, that it's not something that you tattoo on your arm one day yeah. and then you're that way forever, right? You have to you, you keep you, you keep committing yourself over and yes, over Yes, that's right, that's right. For me, I would say, just say for me that um, I'm even more committed to being conscientious objector, or, or, or objecting to war than right, I ever exactly. was. I think it, it, it increases. Uh, the, and, and then, uh, so you, you started writing poetry around that time? Well, or, I've been or, writing or, a little bit of poetry in college, and enough to sort of, you know, give me the idea that that was really something I needed to do. Yeah. And then, um, but I, I think the, the, the disruption of life, I was still writing, but the disruption of life was such that I didn't know what to do. So I went to graduate school. I was very fortunate I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. Oh, and, wow, that's and, a tough, uh, that's a and, tough road. And, there. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> and because uh, the, the, was the, there. the English department, oh, yes, of course. So he social thought. thought. Right, he, and, uh, he, uh, I remember when he won the Nobel Prize. So he, I, I was living in Chicago at the time, yeah. Well, and, he, he was my teacher. Wow, and, um, incredible. And, and I, it was an entry into an intellectual world, and, and it wasn't strict academics. It was really an intellectual world. My other main teachers were David Green, the classicist, Victor yes. Turner, the anthropologist. It was a, a and came Ramanujan, the linguist and poet, and uh, so it was a wide variety of disciplines. And um, it you took, got a PhD eventually. Yeah, yeah, it took a while, <laughs> yeah. but I, it took a while in part because I moved to Boston. My parents were still alive in Providence. My then girlfriend was going to Harvard. She's still my wife now, but, uh -huh. um, but, but I moved to Boston and lucked out with a, I was still a graduate student, but I get a full-time teaching job at Suffolk University. Oh yeah, and you've been there ever since. Not quite. I oh, finished the dissertation, uh, but I wasn't writing enough poems and I had to make an existential decision. I had to walk away from a tenure track job to concentrate on my poems. Wow. And, and, um, and I thought I was leaving teaching, um, but teaching oh. wasn't the problem. Well, was, nobody would do that today. Nobody would yeah, walk away from know, a tenure track know, job. But I, loved, <laughs> but I loved out. I, I ended up teaching expository writing at Harvard. Richard Marius was the director there, and he wanted to hire writers to teach writing. That was his idea. And then I taught in history and literature at Harvard for three years. And I had also taught for a couple of years at BU. I was making my way up and down the Charles River. Mm -hmm. And um, in the middle of my second year at BU, I was invited to come back to Suffolk and um, uh, direct a program I had helped start in the beginning, an interdisciplinary yeah, program. Yeah. And I, I took that opportunity and went back to Suffolk in 1988, and I was there ever since, until 2014. Okay, we're talking with uh, Fred Marchand, my good friend, uh, who I've known for, so I've known, I know your work very well. And um, this is um, a New England Authors with Camille Nasser. So uh, we're talking a little about your life. Let's tell us about poetry. So I have, um, an, 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 I have an impossible question for you. Define poetry. Yeah, it's, okay. it, it, it's a great question. It's the right question. And it's the question that in our time, you know, one always struggles with. You know, maybe a hundred years ago, one wouldn't even think, well, what, you know, what's poetry and what's not? Everybody knows what poetry is. But it is the modern and postmodern situation to have everything that's iconic and stable shaken. And so um, I have a kind of relativistic, but in a good sense, a relativistic sense of what poetry is. I think of it as language that's been charged to do things that it, that it doesn't do ordinarily. Like condensed language? Well, con or, condensation or, is one aspect yeah. of it. Images, lots of images, vivid, vividness. Met metaphors, like if you yeah. read, If you read an ordinary um, manual in assembling a chair, like the chairs we're sitting in, that's language that has a certain utilitarian function, right? Right. It just, and often it's pretty abstract. It gets hard to follow, right? But, and then you have other kinds of language that, you know, newspaper reports. The desire is to make sure that a certain kind of information is available. I think, and then there's narrative of all sorts, right? Well, whatever poetry does, it takes the material of of literature and it yeah. takes words themselves and tries to make them do more. Yeah. And so, 
you know, I think of songwriting as is oh, absolute absolutely. poetry. Oh, right? absolutely. You poetry, know, when I yeah. listen, I listen. You know, when I write, I listen to music, and I listen to songs. You know, and I always yeah. am sort of. Uh, reminded of the roots of poetry in right. music, right? Yeah. That way. So music is one way in which language is taught to do something it doesn't ordinarily do. Yeah. It's made more rhythmic, more emphatic. Via its mm. music. Yeah. And and I would also say, and I think you know this about me. I don't get. I don't sort of say, okay, here's poetry. Here's the line. Yeah, it's not. And, and there's <laughs> no, that's not poetry. I yeah. Think, I think that even yeah. even greeting card verse, it's a wide spectrum. Yes, yes. I was say, saying to you earlier that yes. you know, in a greeting card, the bad poetry of greeting cards. Right? <laughs> yeah. but one of the ways in which you know it's not so great is that you read it only once, and that's it. Right? Yeah, and you're, you know? you're satisfied. Exactly. Right. But you, you know, the other day, the other day, so, uh, I was going talking with someone about um, uh, the Minutemen and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I uh, said, uh, and uh, she didn't know the the uh, Longfellow right. poem, the, the Midnight Ride. Right. Paul Rupert listen my children yeah. you shall hear uh, and uh, so I read it and it's kind of fun yes it is you know, I wouldn't read it every day but it's it's uh, it's well, and also in a, in a time when there wasn't all of the electronic entertainment, yeah. you know, you can imagine how what a, what a joy it would be to sit around the fire and read yeah. that poem. So tell us about your sister. Uh, well, that's another... Because yeah, uh, I want to read here, my own, I want I want a poem. here we are smiling about poetry and, yeah. and its joy. Well, of course, part of another dimension of poetry, and another, the reason why you charge language with uh, possibility, is that, that it's a way of turning in the direction of things that are very difficult. And you know, from yeah. the great sadness, the tears. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yes. And my my sister, my um, as she's my stepsister technically, but um, she was fourteen years older than me. But I grew up with her, so right. she was this, my, the sister in the house as I grew up, and um, and you know, a bit of a mentor. She was she um, she wanted to be a painter, and she studied to be a painter, and sadly, after she had graduated from art school. Um, schizophrenia took over her life and so for the rest of her life it was a struggle inside and out of hospitals mm -hmm. halfway houses mm -hmm. and whatnot and, um, and 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 while and I and I one of the things I, I really wanted to convey in the the work that I've done with her is, is her vitality yeah. you know and so, truly her vitality even though she was suffering yeah so the poem is entitled Her. If you don't mind if I read it, no, right? No, I would I'd be honored okay. to hear you read it. Her last day on the planet, th she thrashed and spit while the nurses tied her wrists to the bed rail with strips of cloth that only worsened what was happening. Her face was radiant, her whole being flush from the long struggle with those she knew she would never have trusted. She tried to keep track of her vitals, uh, I'm sorry, they tried to keep track of her vitals, charted her erratic heart, peered into the cranium with a flashlight through, her, through the eyes. She said that they had taped a death line to the port in her arm. They said that she, uh, they said she should believe in the plastic tube at her nose that it would fill her lungs with good, clean air. She shook her head as hard as she could, got her whole body to say, Nope, thou shalt not, no way, nothing doing, thou shalt not touch me. Not with the elbow, bendable straw adjusted to the lips, not with the insidious needle pointed upwards and dripping over, and absolutely not with that wheezing apparatus of the unacceptable, the big attendant in his scrubs was wheeling in. Thank, mm. thank, thank you, Camille. Uh, yeah, it's, you read it's, this. A, it's a moving poem. You read that so yeah. beautifully. All, all, all these poems are very moving poems. Um, and, um, and some of them, some of them you have to read three or four times. To, to understand what's happening. You know, you know? and, that, and that's, that is part of um, what poetry is. That's how you sort of start to understand how the realm, you know, the, the domain of poetry might yeah. be. That, that you can return to it. Sometimes you're asked to return to it. And you get enough of a hint the first time that it's worth returning to. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so that there's a sense of reward. I, in revising poems, for instance, I often ask myself these days, I say, is this poem still telling me it should, I should do more with it? Is it trying to say there's more to be done here? And in the reading of it, there's you know, maybe the sense that the reader has, or the listener, that, hmm, I'd like to hear that again. I think there's more to it than I've absorbed this one time. Yeah. Right? And as you were reading, I was looking at the cover of the book, and I, I think I, since it's being, you know, on the screen and shown, I should say a word about it. First yeah. of all, the oh, this is I, I didn't even introduce right. the book. This is your latest yeah. book, Sad Nazi. <laughs> no, right, right. You've had you've had what uh, four volumes I, of poetry. I, I have five yeah. volumes of poetry. Five. One published in Ireland, but four in the U.S. Yeah, yeah. And this uh, this uh, just came out, Sad Not Sad. From Grey Wolf uh, Press, yeah, in Minneapolis. Grey Wolf. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And, and um, well, when as you were reading, I was thinking how um, how how meaningful it is. I hope to you and to the reader as well as to me, the title of this book, the the idea that poetry consists of what is said and what is not said too. And part of the work of poetry is to evoke some of the things that are so hard to say. Mm -hmm. But you get an idea or at least a right. hint of it. Yeah. And as you were reading, I felt there were some said and not said dimensions to that. And then you can see the, the cover, the image of the cover. It's, it's a beautiful collage, montage collage, yeah. uh, by Peter Sachs, uh -huh. who is a, um, among other poets and a very great painter, also teaches in the Harvard English Department. And, um, and I was introduced to this series of, of paintings and collages uh, that he's done recently um, by my friend Bill Corbett, another longtime Boston resident. And I'd actually seen them in a magazine too. These are he has a series of these called codex. Codex is the word for those rolls of scrolls right. in the ancient world. Yeah, that's right. You, you can see that, that these are, he had, you can't see it on a television screen, but the background has, has some crumpled hand um, crumpled writing paper with typescript on it. You can hardly read the words. And so these, these the, and these are, the image is made out of cloth. And so what I see and I look at this image is a variety of things. And I told Peter about this and when I was looking, telling him, I love this one. So I see a fellow trying to fly a kite, uh -huh. right? And, and the background is all words, right? right? right. And then, but at the same time, I also see somebody holding on for dear life as he swings across something, uh -huh. a, a big chasm of words. And so I thought that the image itself was both said and not said. I see, I see. You know, you know uh, Fred Marchand uh, here, you know, I have, a, I have a whole list of questions I haven't even gotten, I haven't even touched them. But we yet. like to you talk, know, we know that, you right? Know, yeah, so um, um, you work with veterans afterwards? Or yes. Or with conscientious objectors or with veterans as well? Both, as, actually, both, yeah. both and, 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 and some conscientious objectors who were in the military, as I was. Yeah. Um, but let me say a word about that. Yeah, I have a, oh, a great... Vietnam uh, era of Vietnam, people. And then onward, even, even now, I will go to yeah. a group tonight, later tonight, who's mostly Iraq, Afghan war veterans. Yeah. Um, I, I, I owe a great deal to the William Joyner Center, it's now Institute for the Study of War and Social Consequences at UMass Boston, primarily because um, our, when my first book came out, Tipping Point, yeah. um, I was invited to read for them, and I gave a reading from it there, but the very first reading from the actual book was given there. And then that summer, they invited me to come back and at their summer writers conference, and there I met of four Vietnamese writers, contemporary Vietnamese yes, writers. Yes. And I discovered that the Joyner Center had been doing this wonderful cross-cultural translation effort, both visits from veterans to Vietnam and the, um, Vietnamese writers here, American writers going to Vietnam. And so thus began um, a long relationship with Vietnam. But my relationship with Vietnam was not in the military, but actually in the aftermath. And it was with um, the veterans of the William Joyner Center. Mm -hmm. He also taught veterans yeah. there, and that, and I, I've often thought, you know, at first I thought, am I really a veteran? Which of course is one of the really interesting <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, you consider yourself. Well, you were, yeah, you were a marine, right? Yeah, and for yeah. two years, and, yeah. and 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 yet at the same time, one of the one of the great things has been that that the great learning how how expendable the concept of veteranhood is. And especially in our time, that we now see, for instance, you know how they're having such a rough time. Yeah, uh, but all also, the suicides but, think, but, and, uh, but think of their families too. Yeah, uh -huh. they, are, are they not veterans too? 
and think of think of the, what it means to be in a society in which there are veterans who are neglected. Aren't we all somehow responsible in some way? Yes, so, definitely. So yeah. again, like with poetry, I think of it as a spectrum. You know, there are, there's a wide variety of ways of being a veteran or committing oneself to understanding what it means to being a veteran. And for me, that's it's always been a part of my teaching And so life. you kind of talk, you talk about workshops. literature and, and poetry no, and No, stuff. writing workshops, oh, mostly. Well, so, to, so tell us. How do you write a poem? <laughs> you know, that's where do you good. start? Now that's, you that's, a, that's a really I got, tough I got some ideas, I got some metaphors, uh, yeah. what do I do? You know, it's, you know, I want to go back to the, the, the thing I said earlier that Saul Bellow once said about being a reader who's moved to emulation. I begin my writing practice, but I do it every day, absolutely every day I do this, but whenever I'm writing, I often have reading nearby. It's sort of like, a, it's a way of entering the world, the world of imagination and words is to read. And so I, I read a poem to begin with. I often, you know, I often think of um, the, the, the beginnings of poetry, are, you know, are probably in song, but you know, you're moved to sing because there's something happening, right? Yeah. And, and so um, when I... When I but poetry was sung at, yeah, at the time but, of Homer. But, but, the, the, you know, yeah. but it's a wedding or it's a funeral, no. you know, but so, there's an event. So the reading is like an event, a small imaginative event, so I moved. I feel what words can do. And, and the, in, the, in the Middle Ages in Europe, when the church was sort of um, um, supreme, yeah. uh, there were monks in Ireland who would be copying those, those illuminated manuscripts. And there were some monks who would write little poems in the margin. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, 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 I, and I tell my students that it's okay to write poems in the margins of your book or whatever we're doing. I'd rather not, write a, unless it's a library book. Well, yeah. that's right. it's, but it's, it's, so if you're writing a poem and not listening to me, it's okay. Otherwise, you know, you should pay attention. But if you end up writing a poem in your notebook, for instance, yeah. it's okay. Actually, that, um, that does remind me of... Um, um, of a poem, but we're running out of time. I can see no, that. So I'm no, going to guide, no, I'm gonna no, guide on you. Yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to ask you one, one other question that you got me thinking. Okay, you know, um, uh, young people, you, you're been in touch with young people yeah, because you've been for, at Suffolk. Taught for 31 years at Suffolk. At Suffolk, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, is poetry relevant to, to young people? Uh, what are people reading? What are they writing? What's, what's the, what's the new generation coming you know, up? You know, with? I. I, 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 mean, I mean this with all sincerity, and of course I'm you know, humble and I'm trying to say this with care, but I think there's a hunger and yearning for, for the kind of authenticity that, with language that poetry represents. Yes. And so that whether it be in songs, you know, whether it be in you know, poetry in books, whether it be, whether it be just the, the mere fact that you go and you, you, you think you don't like it and you suddenly do. And I've seen that time yeah, and time again. Yeah. Right? You're inventing words too, uh, yes. so that's poetry, and right? Language, you're, 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 yeah, and everyone ha and the making... language is free in some mm -hmm. way, right? Mm -hmm. You have to. It's yours. It's yeah. yours without sort of penalty, so to speak, right? Yeah. And it, and there's something you can do with it, and and often, you know, and I've seen it time you know, over the years. Of course, there are variations, but time and time again, suddenly a, a collection of words means a lot to someone beforehand that would never have thought they would have meant yeah, that. Yeah. You know, and I they don't have to be writers for mm -hmm. that to happen. Mm -hmm. There's a yearning for that what poetry delivers. Mm -hmm. And what did William Carlos Williams say that you know that you know you don't get the regular news from it, but people die every day for not getting what is in poetry. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well Fred Marchand, um, okay, read us a read us a poem. Well should I read the, the last poem? Yeah, or? go ahead. All right. Well, I wanted to read a poem today that that just, Wait, you have about a minute here. Oh, great. This is a poem that, that really comes out of the, the Contents Objectors okay. world, right? All right? Even though it's about trees. Okay, go right? ahead. But it's about the olive harvest. And you know, the olive tree and the olive branch yeah. has always been a kind of emblem of peace. And this is about peacemakers. Okay. Olive harvest. It's true. The tree has the scent of the sea. But the silver leaves, their slender fingers, thick, infinitely twined trunk, some riddle in the roots that lets it drink from the stones, even the place where a limb has broken or been lopped off, the shoot that springs back to life, stumps that burn for hours, hours upon hours, a scattered discard twig you press to your lips, 
and the fruit that hangs from young branches and old, a green reddening to black, this fruit ripened on enough bloodshed and hardened human behavior to make you think it will turn away in disgust. Year after suffering year comes back as if to say, here and here and here. Fred Marchand, thank you for being with us. Thank, thank you for the Thank you. Thank you for tuning in.